Good to see you all in the house. Are you doing good today? Would you join me and put your hands together one more time for all of our friends and spiritual family watching online? <laughs> Welcome today. Thank you for tuning in. Would you do me a favor? Would you hit the share tab there on your device and, and share with your friends because we want to get the worship that just happened and this message out to as many people as possible. Thank you so much. It means the world to me. Everybody, I want to let you know about three awesome opportunities coming up. The first is next Sunday is Heart for the House Sunday. Now, let me explain to you what this means, because we've had lots of questions, those of you that are new. Why do we do a special offering uh, called Heart for the House? Well, the reason is pretty simple. Your tithes, which is when you give the first 10% of what you receive, which the Bible promises that if you do that, then you'll be in God's economy and not in your own, and you can trust the Lord with everything else. But your tithes go to cover the cost of ministry. So your tithes, keep the lights on, support missions, support ministries, uh, pay the staff. We're, we're paid by your tithes. Uh, enabling us to, to do things for children, young adults, uh, youth, young adults, uh, in every, every way, it's when you tithe that the basic parts of ministry through High Ridge Church are able to happen. Now, we're doing a lot more beyond that. So my belief is, is that God has given us a special mission to be sure that Christianity in this region doesn't decline, but continues to incline, continues to grow. I'm tired of hearing about churches shutting down and pastors quitting the ministry. So what we have done with the Heart for the House offering, that offering goes directly into replanting and planting churches, raising up and sending pastors. It goes directly into ministry out there, ministry to help the church get stronger. And so I wanna encourage you to take the card on the seat pocket in front of you to just take it home and pray this week and ask the Lord what you might be able to do to help in the Heart for the House offering. Let me tell you what Don and I do. We give a tithe, we give offering beyond the tithe and offering beyond that, and then we pray and ask the Lord to speak to us what we're to do in the Heart for the House offering, and then we give accordingly. I just wanna ask you to do the same. All right, everybody? Second announcement today, second thing I wanna promo is that marriage groups start today. Yes. We wanna do everything we can to turn the tide on the, the disintegration of marriage. We wanna do everything we can to help marriages get stronger and to look more and more like the, the, the way in which God designed them to look. How many of y'all were here a few weeks ago? I don't remember how many it was now, three or four or five weeks ago, when my sister and brother-in-law shared their story about how they recovered their marriage. Can you just give me a wave? Yeah, so we want to help marriages so that what happened to them doesn't happen to you. And if you're wondering what I'm talking about, just go back in the archives on the, on the website and you can watch that message. It was really powerful. And so I wanna encourage you to get into a marriage group. Men, you won't regret it. Now I know what men think sometimes about groups like that. I'm gonna be embarrassed. No, you're gonna get some help. Ladies, I wanna encourage you to be a part with your husband, husbands with your wives, to be a part of a marriage group because I wanna do all we can to help and strengthen marriages. And uh, that's why we're now making it a special focus of our church. So get into a marriage group. Somebody say amen. And then the third opportunity announcement promo is for Thanksgiving baskets. Now Thanksgiving baskets are something we do as individuals, but we kinda all pool it together, where you just make the choice to get everything necessary for a literal Thanksgiving basket, and then bring it here, and then we distribute it to all of our connections. We've got a lot of connections. So this year we are supporting the single moms at Hope Farms, and we're helping them have what they need to be able to celebrate Thanksgiving. Now I know what you might say, last year we had way more come in than, than what we could accomplish, what we could accommodate. And you were generous last year and I'm praying for that again this year. Well, we're also gonna help this year our own chosen families. So, so many families have adopted children and or are fostering children currently. This is a simple way to just, to just help them out at Thanksgiving time with everything they need to have a phenomenal Thanksgiving meal. You, you might say, and I hope your faith is strong, well, what about if there's more than that? 
We've got plenty of connections. We're connected at Beautiful Feet. We're gonna, you'll see some of the connections in the lobby. Pregnancy Lifeline, we, Pregnancy Center. I, I'm, I'm not able to do it from memory. We can cover it. If you bring 100 baskets, we got you covered. We'll get those out to families in need and we'll help those families at Thanksgiving. So lots of opportunities. I wanna encourage you to join in and to jump in. All right, grab something to get some notes today. I wanna help you. The title of the teaching today is Helping the Fatherless. Helping the fatherless. Many, many times in scripture we see the importance of this and so I wanna teach you about it today. The Lord first, first, <laughs> the first, first, first put this on my heart about 32 years ago when I, when I had a verse in the Bible, which I'll share with you in just a second, really impact my life. And uh, so I connected with a couple of guys out of Arlington, Texas, building orphanages in Mexico and ministering to orphans in Mexico and it changed my life. I took my whole family uh, down crossing in Laredo, going all the way down. We were out past um, Saltillo, out in some villages where orphanages were being built and, and God allowed us to make a huge impact and I've never been the same. It changed my life, it changed the way that I think. Now we got busy with family and church life and I had to kind of back away from that but praise God, about 10 years ago, a couple of families in our church life really took on the burden for the fatherless, for the orphan and began to minister. David and Amy Simpson uh, started ministering to orphans in Ethiopia. And it's called Beloved Ethiopia, and it's awesome. I don't know how many orphans they're up to now, how many fatherless, uh, maybe 50 plus, that they're ministering to. Matter of fact, if you got time this afternoon and you like to shoot guns, how many people like to shoot guns? Give me a wave. Uh, they, their fundraiser is this afternoon, and it's a Defender Outdoors, and it is, it is an opportunity where you can pitch in. And then right here in our own church family, I see some of the... Some of the Reedlands sitting right over here. The Reedland family has taken upon themselves, it's, it's called Hope Local, and uh, we sponsor them from our church, and now this is an independent ministry in a bunch of different counties around here, helping kids that need some help uh, get into foster care and Christian homes, adopted into Christian homes, et cetera. And so I'm just really excited to tell you this is already going on. I just wanna stir up everybody else to enjoy the fun as well. So where does this come from? James chapter one, verse 27. The Bible says this. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. So pure religion. A pure, a pure way of operating with God. To visit orphans, literally means to help, to, to assist orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. In other words, since God cares about the fatherless, we should too. Let me say that again, because that needs a better amen than that. Since God cares about the fatherless, we should too. Amen. Let me give you some statistics about what's happening in just the United States as a result of fatherlessness. 90% of all inmates in the United States are men. 70% of those men grew up in fatherless homes. 63% of youth suicides can be attributed to fatherless homes. 90% of homelessness comes as a result of fatherless homes. 85% of teen behavior, ab abnormal behavior, comes as a result of fatherless homes. 80% of all rapists come from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. Listen, the spirit of abandonment is that work in our world today resides right here in our communities. And let me tell you something, it is not a spirit that came from God. It's a wicked spirit. Working, trying to destroy lives by destroying families right here in our own community. But I've got good news for you today. But God, but God has a plan to make a difference, has a plan to change lives, and we're a part of that. Let me give you another scripture uh, showing this. Deuteronomy 24, 17 and 18. You shall not pervert the justice due to, and then he gives three people groups. The sojourner, so everybody look here, sojourner just simply is someone that travels. Now in biblical times, most of the population traveled by foot. If you had a little bit of wealth, you might, have, you might have a beast of burden you could ride on or maybe have a, a donkey or a mule loaned to you. If, you. if you had more wealth even beyond that, you might have a cart or a chariot. But most people walked and there were no hotels in those days. Now many times at Christmas, 
We, we think about the fact that there was, quote unquote, no room for Joseph and Mary and soon to be baby Jesus in the inn. Friends, listen, there were no hotels in Judea at the time of Christ's birth. That word inn simply means guest room. So everybody's guest room was already filled up and nobody had any space in their house to give Joseph and Mary somewhere to stay and therefore they had to stay in a cave with the animals and that's where Jesus was born. So sojourner, the second, do not pervert justice for the fatherless. That's what we're talking about today. Or take the widow's garment in pledge. Now let me ask you this, out of those three, the traveler, the widow, and the child, which is the most vulnerable? The children, the children. Why? Because that's referencing from kids from age birth to age uh, coming of manhood or womanhood, 14, 15, 16 years old. Widows might be widows in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, still able to carry on life. It's not just as we think about widows today of, of having lost their spouse later in life. This is talking about children who have no one to take care of them. They're the ones the most vulnerable. Now look at verse 18, Deuteronomy 24, 18. But you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this. To do what? To help the fatherless. To help them. To help redeem them. To make a way for them that they can't make for themselves. It's something that is very, very powerful in the kingdom of God. I wanna give you some more statistics. In 1950, statistics tell us that less than 5% of children born in America were born out of wedlock, born into relationships where the mom and dad weren't married, only 5%. In 2017, what do you think that percent has grown to? 51%. Over half of all children born today are born to parents that aren't married, that aren't married. The degeneration that's taking place in our world. I wanna stop degeneration in church life and I wanna stop degeneration in family life. It's an assignment I believe God has given me. Therefore, planting and replanting churches, raising up pastors and sending them and doing everything we can to help God's people in the family unit to try to help marriages stay strong and be able to make it, to try to help, to try to help children who, who might become a statistic, but I believe that, that they're not supposed to. Why the great increase? Why from 5% to 51% in just a short period of time? I'll tell you why. Because our government got the bright idea, and I'm submitted to the governing authorities. I pray for the governing authorities. I'm not, I'm not speaking slander against the government. But in order to try to solve a problem, which at the time wasn't that big of a problem, the government decided to start taking our tax dollars and paying women to have children. And the government tried to become the father in the home. And listen, friend, fathers can't be replaced in the home. It just can't happen, especially by the government. And so what happened is more and more ladies are having children many times not even certain who the father is in order to get more money to live on. And that is not the plan of God. Why? Because those kids grow up not knowing the family as God designed the family to operate. Not knowing the blessing of it. See, men and women are not the same. Every home needs a father and a mother. Men and women are not the same. Equally powerful, yet distinctly different. Now, now, husbands, that was a chance right there for you to say amen and score some points. <laughs> Let me read that again. Men and women are not the same, equally powerful, yet distinctly different. Amen. <laughs> it is best for a child to have both a masculine and feminine effect in the home. Both are needed. So let me give you some side effects of fatherlessness. I wanna give you three of these today. Side effects of fatherlessness. Number one, men are being feminized and women are being masculinized. See, when there's only one woman or, uh, or multiple women in the home raising sons, the percentage of those boys becoming feminized increases astronomically. While at the same time, women raising boys have to become more masculinized in order to raise those boys. Why? Because testosterone has an effect. 
It just does. And then what is happening is, is that the gender roles are changing and it's not the way God designed it to be. The same is true to a lesser degree. Now listen to me, fathers. When the father is in the home, but completely disengaged. Doesn't think he needs to do anything to help around the house. That's her job. Doesn't think he needs to do anything to, to, uh, to, in raising the kids. She's the one that had them. She's the one that raises them. Terrible mindset. I love you enough to tell you the truth today if you have that mindset. Terrible mindset. That's not gonna bless those kids. Homes need, especially Christians' home, need, need fathers and mothers that love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and love each other and both love the kids. That's what homes need. Do you realize that today we have more fatherless homes than any time in history, the history of our nation, except for after the Civil War? After the Civil War, I think, I, I can't remember my stats, I read it, but I didn't note it down, I forgot, but I think 700,000 roughly men died in the Civil War. Might not be that many, I don't remember, but anyway, a lot. The highest time of fatherless homes after the Civil War until right now. Let's make a difference in that, shall we? Let's make a difference by having a heart for the fatherless. I wanna tell you a little bit about uh, what happened to me as I was growing up. So I grew up, my dad was a welder at Caterpillar Tractor Company, uh, which was in Decatur, Illinois at that particular time, Peoria Indicator. And um, he would clock in every morning at 7.18 and clock out at 3.18 and come home uh, to me and my brother and my little sister, quite a bit younger than me and my brother. So uh, me and my brother were two of 23 boys just on our street within a four-year age span. So eight houses, 16, 16 houses on our, on our block, and um, 23 boys within a four-year age gap. So needless to say, there was lots of stuff going on on the streets of, 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 of our home. Wilder Street had a lot of stuff going on. How many of y'all remember playing baseball in the street? Football in the street? How many of y'all remember, remember yelling, car? And then everybody scatters to the side, the car comes through and everybody comes back in? That's the way I grew up. We didn't wear, wear sunscreen. We just wore a pair of shorts all day long and that was it. We ended up looking like coffee beans at the end of summertime. No shoes, our feet could handle everything. No sunscreen wasn't invented then. We drank out of the hose and we didn't die. And us 23 boys played constantly. And so my dad kind of caught on that, that, that one of the families didn't have a dad in the home. All the rest did, but one family had three sons and uh, didn't, didn't have a dad in the home. And so he kind of caught on that, that perhaps he needed to be involved with all the boys in our neighborhood just to kind of referee sometimes because there were lots of, lots of disagreements and lots of fights. And, and we played a game called kill the man with the ball. Anybody played that game? Yeah, the way that game works, let me just tell you, because it is a blast. Somebody has the football, everybody else is standing around, 23 boys, just envision it, in the front yard of 2230 North Wilder Street, where there were four trees equally planted in a square at the four corners of the front yard. And somebody's got a football in the middle and dad yells go and whoever's got the ball throws it as high as they can up in the air. Everybody's running trying to get it and whoever gets it has to catch the ball and then run to one of those four trees before anybody else tackles them or kills them and then they score a point. It was wonderful. <laughs> it was such a blast. But my dad was there kind of providing some refereeing and some, some insights and, and sometimes... Uh, boys would start crying. And he knew, he just had that sense to know it wasn't out of hurt, it was out of frustration. And he came up with sayings that just amazed me, like, well, stop crying, because if you, if you keep crying, your muscles aren't gonna work right. <laughs> just stuff like that, that that he put into us and, and helped us to understand how important it was to, to, to understand what boys needed to be like. My dad helped and you, get, you might take this the wrong way, but please don't. He helped us masculinize. He helped us to understand what it was like to be boys. Girls weren't allowed in that game. That was just an all boys game and we could go for it. My dad taught us how to play and my mom comforted us when we fell and when we were hurt. And I thank God for being able to grow up in that home. Number two, the second symptom of fatherlessness 
is masculinity, mask, <laughs> I messed this up first service a zillion times. That is being labeled as a dysfunction. <laughs> there. And the number one reason for this, being labeled as a dysfunction is this, is that women are being impregnated by men, but not by fathers, and they're becoming embittered as a result. Think about that. And so the embitterment is causing them to hate men, even though it was a man, a man that they sought out to be with in order to, to, to conceive that child. But the embittering is not harming the, the adults nearly as much as it's harming the kids for parents to have a root of bitterness. I'm gonna teach you sometime soon about a root of bitterness. It is wicked, and you don't want it in your life. Generally speaking, women don't know how to deal with aggression in boys, generally speaking. Now, I had to teach this to Dawn uh, after we started having a family. So for those of you that are, that are new, my lovely bride is right here. She's the real brains of the outfit. And... Um, and uh, we have five children. Now, I've heard it said before, man, you must really love children. Well, let me just tell you, I really love my wife, and that's why we have a lot of children. <laughs> and so we had, we had a girl just like her mom, Bethany, sweet, loves to read, quiet. Then we had two boys just like their dad, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy and aggressive. I don't know how many concussions they had, probably about as many as I did. And then, then we had a, a girl who I call my, my Barbie tomboy, and then we had another boy. So there were four of them always wanting dad to help them get into trouble. <laughs> and I loved it. And so there, there would be moments to where the aggression was getting going and she would say, Jeff. Now I know the sound of what Jeff means. <laughs> that means Jeff, I think something bad is about to happen and you need to jump in and do something really, really quickly. Do I need to say it again, Jeff. And so I had, to, I had to teach her the sound of what is safe and the sound of what becomes dangerous with boys who are just being boys. See, when it's still okay, and by the way, one of these days we're gonna do a marriage, or are we gonna do a marriage and family retreat sometime? Okay, she said yes, so we're gonna do it. And uh, we're gonna give you everything that we've learned, both, both hard knock you stuff and then stuff we've involved in our, our family in to try to help you just to take it and make it better. Uh, coming up sometime, maybe in 24. And uh, I just chased a rabbit. Did I catch it? Yeah. Oh yeah, so the sound of boys being boys. <laughs> Understanding what testosterone does to boys. And, and, and so prior to trouble, there's still a giggle involved. Once it's about to change, there becomes a roar. All of you with boys know what I'm talking about. Things change. And then it gets to where it gets really, really bad. Now, if they're in the swimming pool, I just let them go at it. Just let them go ahead and go. But when they're in the house, one time, they wouldn't stop. They wouldn't settle down. And it was switching from fun to not fun. So I just took a broom and just unscrewed the handle, made sure they saw me, and I said, knock it off or else. For a while, that worked. And then they decided that they didn't think I'd really do something. And guess what happened that time? <laughs> All three of them got whacked. I wanna, I wanna start a phrase, and you finish it. You just wait until your father. Oh, you heard it too. See, see, there's a need for it. Why? Because masculinity is not a dysfunction, it's from God. And, and fathers, we need to be putting it out there the right way, with love. I didn't hurt my kids with a broom handle, okay? I was just whacking them on the ankle or something like that. <laughs> Give me a break. I don't want anybody turning me in. Number three, fatherless men tend to relate to women as mothers and sisters because they haven't seen what true romantic love looks like. They haven't seen it. They've seen what Hollywood, I'm sorry, Hollywood thinks is true romantic love on a screen, but that's not true romantic love. That's not true romantic love. I wanted our boys to know what true romantic love looked like. Dawn will be cleaning the table off. They're all sitting there. They didn't want to eat the vegetables, so they're still at the table. And she's starting to clean the table off. And I'm, I'm thinking, this is a great example to show these boys 
a proper way for mom and dad to love each other. I'd just grab her, pull her down, give her a big hug, hold her on my lap, and, and just not let her clear the rest of the table for a little bit. And then kiss her on the cheek. And then tell her I love her. And why did I do that? Well, I do love her, and I do love kissing her cheek. Remember, five kids. And <laughs> I, want, I, wanted, I wanted our kids to see what non-sensual, appropriate love looks like. Grandparents, you can show it as well. Show it to the grandkids. There's nothing wrong with appropriate, appropriate expression of love. I'm not talking about what you, what you see on a screen. That's not appropriate. Not in a God-honoring home. I'm talking about showing it in the right way. Showing it the right way. So what's the conclusion? What's the solution to this problem of fatherlessness? Here it is. We step in and help on behalf of the Lord. We step in, the people of God. We're God's hands and feet. It's not that he can't do it, he can do anything. But he's allowing us to get in on the fun. He's allowing us to participate. And there's lots of ways it can happen here. You can foster, you can adopt, you can help those who have. I love the number of grandmas and grandpas that we have that are helping foster care and adoptive families by running errands, by, by picking up and pitching in on, on, uh, on stuff that needs to be done. I love it, it's called wraparound. So there's lots of things we can do. I wanna give you three more scriptures. And this next one is the title of the message today. Job 29, 12. Interesting that in the book of Job, a book about what it's like to endure through difficult times, a phenomenal verse in that, in that book of the Bible about helping the fatherless. Job 29, 12. Because I delivered the poor who cried for help and the fatherless who had no one to help him. Job did that. We can do that as well. Listen, he went through harder times than all of us put together, and he still chose to help fatherless children. Come on, somebody. Psalm 82, verse three. Give justice to vindicate, to redeem, to help out the weak and the fatherless. Hosea 14, verse three. I love this because it shows three distinct categories. Assyria shall not save us. Let me, let me tell you what that means. The most dominant Government in that time can't help the fatherless. And we will not ride on horses. In other words, the wealthy many times are not able to also help the fatherless. And we will say no more, our God, to the work of our hands. Listen, look at this. In you, the orphan finds mercy. Listen, we can't say the government's gonna do it or just people that have, uh, have extra money on hand should do it. No, it's us. It's us, we're the ones called to help the fatherless. The people of God, we're his hands and feet. We make a difference when quite often there's no way for a difference to be made. In you, this is the Holy Spirit speaking to Hosea, to everybody, everybody that was there at that time and everybody that would read it later, which is us today. In you, the orphan finds mercy. And then this is the last thought, and if there was anything that I would hope that you might share, this would be it. It's, us, it's up to us, the hands and feet of Jesus, to care for orphans. Let me take the interrogatory out here. It's up to us to care for orphans. It's up to us. Last year we advocated for a young man named Luke, and now he has found his forever home. <laughs> Praise God. Today, this year, we are advocating for a young lady named Jaquela. Watch her story. My name is Jaquela, and I'm 13 years old. I'm athletic, because I like to play a lot of sports. I am brave. I like to, you know, do my fun stuff. I'm very curious, like, if there was like something over there, <laughs> I have to go see what it is. And I'm very intelligent because all my classes are AP right now. I feel the best way to make someone feel loved is most definitely showing that you care. When I grow up, I want to be a juvenile on college. Like, I want to work with kids because I feel like there's a lot of kids who have cancer and, like, don't really have, like, you know, the support system that they necessarily need. So most definitely, I want to be a juvenile oncologist. Having a forever family, to me, would be like, 
the perfect life because I feel like every child really needs someone to be there for them. So that would be like my perfect ideal life. Being adopted would change my life because, you know, it would boost my confidence. Because knowing that I have someone who's foreverly there for me would really boost my confidence. I could say when I was in a really bad position, church really kind of came up and was really there for me. So I like going to church because, you know, even when certain people aren't there for you, Jesus is always there for you. I want to be adopted. I would love to be adopted. What I would say to my future adopted family would be, thank you so much for adopting me. Um, I know there's a lot in my paperwork. <laughs> uh, I've had a pretty hard childhood, but I've grown from that and that's all in the past. And thank you so much for adopting me and I love you. Highridge would love to invite you to help this child find their forever family. You can help by sharing this video from our social media page today. We want as many people as possible to hear their story. If you're interested in learning more about becoming their forever family, please contact Hope Local or scan the QR code below. Chosen is our foster and adoption ministry at Highridge and how we strengthen vulnerable kids and families for life. You might be wondering, how can I support the families who have answered this call? We want to invite you to join our chosen ministry by serving on a care team or by joining our events team. Care teams wrap around a family for the first six months after taking a foster or adoptive placement. They provide a weekly meal, pantry items, prayer, and support as they adjust to their new family life. Our events team serves and supports our foster and adoptive families through gatherings provided by High Ridge, community outreach such as pregnancy center volunteering, and events to support our local chosen ministry partners. Generosity is at the heart of this ministry. Giving directly to our chosen fund provides financial support to our foster and adoptive families as they navigate the physical, emotional, and financial challenges each child requires. Your generosity provides much needed resources such as counseling, licensing or adoption fees, home studies, and basic clothing, groceries, or supplies for the children coming into their homes. Although we may not be able to do everything, we can all do something. If you're ready to take one of these steps to make a difference in the lives of our chosen families, please visit our chosen ministry page on the High Ridge website or visit the Connect Center after service. Today, we celebrate the incredible life change that has taken place in the lives of over 50 children who have been adopted into High Ridge families. Thank you to our chosen volunteers and to those who give generously to this ministry. Your love and support are vital to encourage and strengthen these families. And to our chosen families, we honor you. Every day, you are the hands and feet of Jesus to your families and those around you. Your obedience and faithfulness truly are living examples of the gospel. Today, we celebrate you. Would you pray? Would you give? Would you help? That's it, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for the blessings of this day. Thank you that your grace has been sufficient for us. Lord, I pray that you would bless us to help your grace be sufficient for others as well. Use us, Lord. We're here to serve you. We're here to, to connect with what's on your heart. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Thank you for today. The blessings of this day have been awesome. Thank you, Lord, for breath and life and health and peace. Thank you, Lord. It's your name that we pray. If you just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed for one more prayer. This prayer is specifically for those of you that would say, you know, Jeff, in all honesty, I don't have this God thing completely worked out yet. If 
If I'm completely honest with myself, I'm not positive that at the end of my life, whenever that might be, that I'm gonna be with God in his heaven forever. I've got my doubts. Well, friend, if that describes you, I just wanna encourage you to recognize something. You don't need to doubt any longer. As a matter of fact, if you could see it, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, loves you so much that he's reaching out his hand right now to meet you in your heart. He wants to do something for you that you can't do for yourself. He wants to forgive your sins, all of them, past, present, and future. And friend, deep down inside, you know your best efforts to be good enough aren't cutting it. That's why you need a savior. That's why you need Jesus. Now you might be here and you say, Jeff, you're describing me. I don't know how to do that though. Well, there was a time, friend, when I didn't know how to do that either. I didn't know how to connect with the Lord. I didn't know how to receive forgiveness. But someone offered to help me pray and I took them up on it. And I meant business in my heart and my sins were forgiven and I started a relationship with Jesus that very moment. And that would be my honor to help you pray and connect with the Lord as well. I'm gonna pray a simple prayer right now, friend, and I invite you, I'll pause after each phrase, I invite you to pray that phrase with me and pray the whole prayer with me as well and let Jesus do for you what you can't do for yourself. All right, here we go. You pray with me, friend. Lord Jesus, I'm choosing to trust in you today. I'm choosing right now to believe that you're God's son and when you conquered sin and death and came out of the grave victorious, I'm choosing to believe you did that for me. And I'm asking you right now, Lord, to come into my life, to take over my life, and to forgive me of all of my sins, past, present, and future. And Lord, I want you to know, pray this, friend, this is very important. I want you to know that starting right now, I'm not gonna live my life my way any longer. Starting right now, I'm gonna live the rest of my life with you. And here's the last part of the prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for just now hearing and answering my prayer. And it's in your name that I've prayed. Amen. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, except for those of you that just prayed with me. If you just prayed with me, would you look up at me right now? Would you look up at me and give me a big wave? Would you wave at me? Yes, 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 yes. Just look up at me and wave at me. Wave at me until I see you. Yes. Just wave at me until I see you. Over here by the doors, I'm looking over here by the doors where you came in, across the center, across the back. Anyone just wave at me? Looking back across the room, anybody all the way over on the right-hand side, anybody pray with me? Just look up at me and wave at me. Good, those that just waved at me, would you look back up at me again? Way to go. I am so proud of you. You just made the best decision you could ever make. Now that you've just taken a step toward God, I wanna help you to learn how to take more steps with God. If you'll take the green card that's on the seat pocket in front of you and pull that green card out, put some contact information on it, bring it to one of our prayer team members here at the front of the service after the service is over with. They're gonna congratulate you, they're gonna encourage you, and if you don't have a Bible, they're gonna give you a Bible because we want everybody who meets Jesus to have a Bible to read. And then the next step that you take after you come and pray with one of our prayer team members is to be baptized. And I've got good news for those of you that just raised your hand. It's next Sunday. And I wanna encourage you to register. Bring your friends and family. It's a big party and a big celebration here for baptism. You won't be embarrassed and you'll be so glad that you gave your life to Jesus. Can everyone look this way, friends? Can we give a big applause for 10 people, 10 in this service, taking a step toward God?